That's the key word. Little tiny laminations here. They said to get laminations, the evolutionist says that occurred over millions of years in a calm ocean. Calm ocean. It would be there. It would lay down a little bit of strata because, you know, the fishes do their things and everything kind of does its thing. It lay down a little bit of strata. Then the ocean dries up and goes away. It doesn't disturb anything. And for maybe another million years, it comes back again. What happened during the million years that it was gone? Nothing grew on it. No roots came down. Nothing disturbed it. There was no wind. No one walked on it. No animal said, hey, uh -huh, nice property. Nothing happened. And it came back and it laid down another thing layer. But we know now that in less than five hours, you can lay down strata, you can lay down laminations, which they've never believed before. This is the Tapete Sandstones in the Grand Canyon. Look at this, look at this trout. Does it look very familiar? They have now rewritten the textbooks about the Grand Canyon. I have a book out there, and I should say the book sale will be Saturday night, uh, probably around four to the six or so. And they have a book out there, it's called Grand Canyon, A Different View. And they're selling it in the government, in the government, um, little, you know, sale place when you go up there in the Grand Canyon, and the evolutionists are just, man, <laughs> huh. But there it is. And the government said, freedom of speech. These guys have it right, I think. And the geologists are now stating that, well, maybe the Grand Canyon wasn't made the way we thought it was. Maybe a water-charged slurry someplace to the northeast broke and came through and created the Grand Canyon. And this Tapete sandstone, <coughs> excuse me, it is not just isolated right there. They don't tell you that all of this layering is almost throughout all of North America. Now how do you lay down something like this throughout all of North America? And of course, parts of it erode away and stuff like that, but we can see it. You can do this by satellite and penetrate by radar, and you can look down into the layers. You can see this whole layer going across North America. What would do that? Nothing short of a cataclysmic flood. That explains it. It doesn't explain it any other way. The steam explosion pits. You saw those big chunks of ice flying off? They would land, crash, and then you'd have 300 to 600 feet of ash, dirt, debris, all dumped on top of it. What's going to happen? All that pressure and all that heat gets that water just boiling beyond, way beyond 212. Remember that the temperature was 1800 degrees Fahrenheit when it exploded out of Mount St. Helens. Well, you've got all this pressure and eventually, within a day or so, you started hearing these screaming little demons out there as the water had moved itself up and formed and blew out its steam, and you had all these steam explosions. This is a little bit overdone, isn't it? Let's go to this one. Steam explosion pits. Now, this is one of them. It's um, actually, it's about a thousand uh, feet wide and about three, about, no, actually about, yeah, a thousand feet wide with 2,300 feet long. So a thousand by 2,300. And from the bottom to the top, it's a little over 100 feet. Now, if you look at this, look at the gullies and the rills. I mean, doesn't it look like erosion? If you came across this with today's, with yesterday's geology book, you'd say that this took millions of years with water cascading down somehow, and must have gone down the drain, and disappeared. But, guess what? This was made, this steam explosion pit was made in five days. And I've got something that's very important, and you're going to have this over anybody that comes tomorrow and didn't go up to see this. And I'll remind you. What made the steam explosion pit? When I first saw this, and I was, you know, turning the pages, and you're reading this thing, you know, and you go into this, and you go, oh, yeah, well, hey, the steam just, you know, just did this little thing, and just carved all that stuff out of it. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. This floor right here was up to here. And as the steam came out, the floor was consumed and dried.
drop. And it was the whole floor as it dropped down that carved out all the gullies and roof. It wasn't water. And that just socks the evolutionary geologists because they thought only water could do that and do it like this. It's rewritten the geology textbooks. If you're looking here at Lewitt Canyon, here is 100 feet of canyon wall. And the evolutionist says that canyons are carved out by you know, rivers. Well, this water here is not the source of this canyon. The canyon was carved out first and was carved out over the summer um, and early into autumn. And the little water found its way down the canyon after the canyon was uh, carved out. If you come over to Step Canyon, you've got three layers. You've got this one down here, which is a, uh, a tough bed, an ancient andesite up here, a mud breccia. So one, two, three. All of this area, all the way up to here, is rock, solid rock, that was below the level of the um, surface before the eruption. As a matter of fact, Step Canyon, this is solid rock, and this is carved out by the May 18 explosion and then filled back in by other explosions. This canyon was actually, at one time, they got pictures of this because it got filled in. At one time, during the first explosion, this was 700 feet deep, a 700 foot deep canyon carved out of solid rock made by a small volcano. This again goes completely against evolutionary thought that you can carve, that a catastrophic event can actually create canyons, can carve out, lay down strata as small as one millimeter, perfectly arranged in size and density. On March 19, 1982, this next very important explosion did something very helpful. When the mountain exploded, it blew out north again. It had all the snow melt. It had a whole collection of material and rocks and underneath a bunch of ash. And when it exploded, it blew all of the debris out to the north and it curved itself and it dug out this now you're heading west here so you're east you're heading west it dug out all these canyons and it did so in about four hours okay all the canyons hundred foot deep canyons and you remember the third map that I showed you that cold water lake now had an outlet and castle lake that was what gave me the outlet it suddenly carved all this out and now you have an outlet. It created what is called the Little Grand Canyon. Here is a picture of it. This one right over here is the Little Grand Canyon. It is 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. This is Engineers Canyon here. You've got five canyons all coming together, all that were made in about four hours. Here you can see the various layers, the strata. It's a little over 100 feet here. Here, this is, this is the Little Grand Canyon. Here you see a little bit of water coming down. Engineers Canyon, 100 foot right here. Here's this little bit of water. Did this water make this canyon? No, no. And you don't have to believe it because you look at the amount of water going through here and what the evolutionists did was say, hmm, that much water going across this much land would take X amount of millions of years to carve out this canyon. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, as creationists, we said, no, you're not taking into account that there was a worldwide flood. And why does an evolutionist not want to believe in a worldwide flood? Because God warned a whole society and world before the flood that he was God and he was going to destroy the world. So if you're an evolutionist, you're not believing in God. And so therefore the flood is a myth. But the flood explains this very nicely now you can see that something this size can be carved out and done in just a few hours. It's just totally amazing.